somewhere in the 80s, uh, Ronald Reagan was credited with uh, bringing communism uh, to its knees and at the same time being credited uh, with introducing the market economy as a kind of global uh, inevitability. And I think that uh, from that moment, and maybe both of these moments, I would say that the West is living uh, in a kind of fake situation in the sense that by embracing the market economy, I think it has lost uh, any claim to moral superiority, but somehow it hasn't uh, kind of realized that. So I'm talking uh, as, of course, a Westerner, uh, but a Westerner extremely critical of our kind of sense of morality and therefore advocating instead of morality, uh, sympathy as the driving force, not only uh, behind our work, but also uh, as a, an important factor in the world. Anyway, so this is Reagan. This is the world uh, that happened, uh, that existed then, uh, the Cold War, uh, different blocs. But the blocs were very much concerned with each other and, and paid attention to each other. After the fall of the war, Fukuyama kind of spelled and predicted the end of history, and that meant there was an assumption that instead of blocks, the world would be kind of governed by one single uh, system, the market economy, and uh, democracy would be a kind of ultimate and imminent condition. Actually, uh, if you look since then, the opposite, or not the opposite, but uh, some, that prediction didn't happen. And the situation in terms of not free, half free, and free that existed uh, with the fall of the wall is still largely kind of maintained. So there was an illusion that democracy would uh, survive or vanquish or be the ultimate system, but that is so far not the case. And I think that uh, a very important factor to that uh, is, of course, the behavior of the West. Uh, because when Bush introduced in 2002 the axis of evil, we went into a situation that the West, rather than promoting democracy, became extremely aggressive and kind of moralistic uh, in a very raw manner and imposed a kind of vast uh, amount of disruption on the world uh, from which we still haven't remotely kind of recovered. Europe, uh, at that point, uh, kind of resisted that uh, hypothesis massively uh, and compellingly, but at the same time, uh, in a kind of really unfortunate way, uh, most of the European states became part of the coalition of the willing, with Chirac and Schroeder, of course, as kind of really exceptions, uh, and all credit to them for that kind of situation. But anyway, Instead of dissociating itself from, from the American kind of paranoia, we aligned ourselves with it, and I think in that sense also lost a lot of credit. Nevertheless, I think, and, and ever since, the European and American position is uh, a position of pointing fingers at inaccuracies or kind of wrong situations in other kind of states or other systems or other countries. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, of course, the Chinese are continuing kind of meeting, making connections, and uh, not so much embracing, but at least finding uh, forms of collaboration with uh, the same countries that we, uh, with our index finger, uh, continue to reject. Anyway, as a European, I was uh, always deeply upset by this uh, kind of situation and at some point uh, became part of a kind of European effort to rethink that situation. Here you see myself on the right between a number of ex-government leaders. Uh, you see Lech Malenza, Philippe Gonzalez, who navigated uh, Spain from fascism to socialism. In other words, kind of really important and significant leaders. I was the only non kind of politician, but I had to also discover that kind of European Europe is currently kind of organized in such a way that it by definition can only be concerned with itself. Maybe the Barcelona Catalan uh, independence is an example, Brexit is an example, the condition of Northern Ireland is an example, 
uh, Europe is at this point uh, kind of see a, a mass of black matter and cannot uh, look beyond itself. And I think uh, that is kind of really a fairly dramatic situation. Our vision of the world is extremely imprecise, and these are two covers of The Economist. Only two years, The Economist predicted the great fall of China, and now she is the world's most powerful man. And I think that this uh, kind of really points out to a kind of collective attention deficit uh, disorder. We simply are not focused, and we do not uh, kind of really understand the kind of situation. Anyway, in 1994, when I was looking at Singapore, I kind of already had a kind of uh, awareness that this confrontation was uh, uh, going nowhere. And maybe i read one sentence. The next round of his West tension will be fought over this question, whether democracy promotes or erodes social stability, whether free speech is worth the cultural trash it also produces, and whether the health of, collective, of the collective matters more than the unfettered freedom of the individual. And um, in this kind of perspective, I have concentrated or basically focused on maybe the oldest definition of the world uh, and kind of looked into the possible interaction between Europe, Asia, uh, and to some extent Africa as a kind of single uh, entity. So I have taken my distance from the kind of European moralism and I'm focusing on more communicative uh, kind of situation. This is also a diagram that we produced in 2001 even, where we kind of suggested that communication was the most important uh, thing. Communication, yes, with Russia, although Russia is all wrong. Communication, yes, with China, although China is uh, all wrong. Communication with uh, the Arab and regimes, although they're all wrong, and even communication with Iran. And so in this perspective, I will show you, we also in 2005 or kind of suggested the human rights, corruption, freedom of speech, free trade, nuclear arms, copyright, that all these issues were used by the kind of rest against the others and that they all deserve to be kind of reconsidered or renegotiated. I'm not saying they're irrelevant, but I think that the current definition of them has a very negative effect on the overall situation. So what I'm doing now is kind of show some interventions and some uh, episodes of this kind of collaboration in the form of architecture. I was talking about sympathy. I was for the first time in Russia in the kind of late 60s. And uh, actually, uh, what deeply attracted me in Russia as an architect was that the Russians in the 20s had invented different ways of existing in which possessions uh, were uh, less important, where a degree of uh, collectivity was crucial, where sharing all the kind of issues that we are discussing today, where sharing was extremely important and where they found an, an architectural way of articulating these uh, possibilities, this kind of realized utopia. This is a kind of building, uh, uh, collective housing, that uh, of course I had to visit. And I'm kind of simply showing you uh, a number of images. This is the uh, corridor in the kind of 30s, uh, pure and pristine still. Under Stalin, uh, this is the corridor in uh, 1970 when I first visited. This is the corridor in 2001 when I kind of visited uh, again. And this is the corridor in 2011 when I visited again. So you see a kind of drastic decay uh, of this uh, idea and a kind of profound negligence and kind of actually rejection uh, of these ideals and the idea of collectivity. And that is, of course, not a surprise because the, the essence of the market economy is that this uh, kind of existence uh, is implausible and, and cannot really uh, uh, be viable. And, and that is directly translated in kind of ruining them. So for me, it was then became very important to see whether there were possibilities occasionally kind of in the current Russia, in the current and under the current Russian regime to uh, rehabilitate or perhaps transform or to uh, try to maintain some of the kind of forms 
of what I would still call generosity, uh, maybe if it's a dangerous word applied to uh, the Soviet Union. And here in kind of Moscow was a, a, a totally ruined uh, restaurant for 1,500 people, enormous numbers, uh, the numbers of the masses, uh, but a restaurant that was dimensioned to accommodate them and therefore, uh, in my view, uh, extremely suitable to be transformed uh, and to, make, to first of all to be maintained in, in terms of its generous proportions and then transformed with minimal uh, transformation simply by wrapping the whole thing in a layer of polycarbonate, uh, a layer of plastic, so that uh, it could now kind of function as a, an art institution, again, without minimal modification and, and where in which not only the spaces are preserved, but also the decay that uh, we have let it undergo. The de even the decay is preserved as a kind of visible effect of uh, various uh, political systems. But anyway, former ruin, it is now one of the kind of most intensely used parts of uh, Moscow, again with a little transformation on my part, but more uh, a kind of form of rescuing. This is the World Trade Center uh, disaster, which of course was the reason for Bush to unleash the excess of evil. Um, we were at the same time asked to participate in a competition for restoring or resurrecting uh, that in uh, building in Manhattan, or to do the headquarters of the Central China Television. I knew, of course, that uh, China was a communist country, and I also knew that uh, it had performed in the kind of recent decade in uh, an amazing way in terms of undoing poverty for hundreds of millions of, of people. And there was also a sense that uh, liberal tendencies were going to be possible and were going to have an effect uh, on the political system. So for various reasons, uh, but mostly for that reason, again, perhaps the word sympathy is the most precise word to cover my motivation. I participated uh, and won the competition. Uh, and of course, uh, in, in the West, with all its kind of moralism, this was uh, immediately uh, again uh, turned into the buildings of evil and an architect participating in uh, evilness. It's very noticeable and to me very surprising that the kind of intellectual and, and kind of formerly or still leftist part of the intellectual world adopted immediately the kind of vocabulary of Bush. Uh, and, and aligned itself in that sense intellectually with that kind of moralistic kind of reading which wrecked so much havoc uh, on the world. Anyway, uh, CC3 in my view is much more than kind of simply an emblem, it's also a kind of tool, it's a machine uh, that enables the production of media, uh, the d broadcasting of media, uh, but also in, in, includes in, in the pink color a kind of path in which the kind of Chinese public uh, may have access to each section of the cultural production of the cultural production of its own media. And in terms of what I think the building does, it's not only a kind of building for news, but it's also a building that, in a kind of drastic way, introduced a new way of structural thinking in China. China, which presumably for Marxist reasons had a kind of very uh, theoretical and very classical uh, way of uh, imagining structure as smoothly as possible from uh, the top to the bottom, uh, as efficiently as possible. Here, uh, th thanks to the abilities of supercomputers, uh, more sophisticated paths were possible and also alternative paths were possible. We negotiated this with the kind of elite of 300 kind of Chinese uh, engineers who were there as a kind of watchdog that things would uh, happen. And I sincerely believe that the kind of effect of those negotiations uh, have a drastic effect on the kind of possibilities of Chinese architecture, uh, which uh, very visibly uh, it has taken uh, to heart. We were able to do something 
in China, which would be almost impossible to also organize in the West. And what I found touching is that the, the Chinese workers uh, were actually kind of aware uh, of this uh, and sharing in this uh, kind of idea. This is a worker kind of exhausted, but here is a kind of poem that the worker kind of wrote on the steel of the uh, CCTV, which uh, kind of uh, speaks for itself uh, and which also show no matter how high you are, we will fight with your our migrant workers, our great, sorry, the rest. But anyway, a kind of endorsement or, or sharing in the kind of triumph. I think CCTV was not only a very controversial kind of building here in terms of our participation, but also in China. There was a uh, controversy about uh, whether it actually was a, an obscene joke uh, on the Chinese government, uh, which of course, of course it wasn't. But that controversy was a major controversy in China. And of course, part of the building, not the building itself, but the neighboring building went up in flames. And I would say that kind of actually those controversies also contributed to uh, making uh, news uh, in China more transparent in the sense that this was an event that could not be denied or could not be contradicted. And therefore CCTV had no choice except to be completely open about uh, that disaster itself and who had caused it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that the controversy of the building itself contributed to some kind of opening up uh, in China of possibilities. Uh, and of course, there's also the effect of time, the effect of globalization, where Chinese news, if it has um, global pretensions, uh, needs to also become kind of more uh, transparent and more accurate and less biased. I would say that uh, another, and kind of perhaps in architectural terms and in urban terms, the most strongest uh, ability of CCTV or effect of CCTV is that in the heart of a city and of a regime completely dedicated to stability, there's a building that has uh, a number of identities, or almost infinite number of identities, and that kind of uh, in itself is the essence of instability. Uh, and therefore here I show you kind of simply some kind of images. Sometimes it's a ring uh, or an open kind of circle. Sometimes it's a hammer. Sometimes it's a completely unrecognizable kind of shape from outer space. And I would say that all those kind of shifting identities enable it also to exist uh, and coexist with the poorest kind of parts uh, of the city and, and the kind of decaying parts of the city. And that is, uh, again, for me, a source of uh, interest, how to uh, find new things that are compatible with old things. And of course, the new leader of China is known and on record for not liking the building. Uh, and that uh, has forced kind of some of the leaders of uh, CCTV to stay in the old building uh, and, and not to move into the new building. So uh, we now have a kind of very interesting situation that the old part of CCTV is staying in the old building and that the new and kind of modern part of the CCTV, which considers itself uh, almost as a kind of BBC, is in the new building. So in the end, there is a kind of poetic justice in terms of how it works. We also have worked systematically in the Arab world. And of course, uh, that is also uh, controversial. Uh, but I hope to kind of show that there, even there, or maybe exactly there, there is a number of uh, efforts uh, going on and uh, a necessity to see where you can do uh, important and good things. Here uh, we have Obama kind of undoing part of the kind of damage, but in a fairly ambiguous way, as we know, kind of since uh, of Bush by not by saying there is no imposition of kind of political systems. Uh, and in 2010, the Americans opened, uh, and that was a forward-looking uh, step. And Obama opened an embassy in Syria, reopened the embassy in Syria. Syria at that point was a country that was seen, it could go either way, it could perhaps with communication be pulled 
into uh, more communication with the Ken West or it could go the other way. And there were many signs of this kind of shift. Not only the opening of the embassy, uh, Aga Khan uh, invested heavily in the kind of country. Uh, the UNESCO became very active and a coalition of kind of major institutions kind of uh, got together to uh, work on a kind of museum for archaeology in Damascus. And we were part of that uh, competition, invited, and the competition was at the last moment kind of cancelled because, of course, the situation in uh, Syria went completely wrong. When, and in my view, it went completely wrong, but I'll talk about that later. So before that competition, I was in Syria, uh, kind of lectured to kind of Syrian audiences, young Syrian students, at another motive that was to uh, photograph the palace of Assad, which was by a Japanese architect, Kenzo Tange, on which I was doing a book. There were no photographs of it, so uh, I got access. You see it here on top of the hill. Here you see a kind of modern but monumental kind of palace. Uh, typical 70s uh, architecture, where the entire world uh, was become, Africa was becoming independent, where the entire world was no longer looking at uh, European and Western examples, but embracing uh, foreign influences as, as Japan to articulate its new values. So here you see that palace, the interior of the palace, extremely modern, but also monumental and the kind of intimate workspaces of that period. I was asked to do landmarks, but uh, of course I, I, ref I prefer to do kind of more significant interventions. This was a kind of ruin of a parking garage in the heart of uh, Damascus, uh, a useless thing. Everybody thought, but I kind of proposed that it could be used and kind of reused and, and turned into uh, an, a cultural institution. And, and uh, again, with minor modifications, and at some point, we discussed and proposed looking at the issue of agriculture, agriculture in the whole of Syria, uh, the issue of how water was distributed. And of course, it's kind of very disconcerting that these plants that we produced are uh, almost uh, identical to the distribution of uh, later ISIS in uh, Syria. I was also asked to look at Palmyra and to see to what extent uh, Palmyra could become uh, not only preserved, but uh, to find a new way of conceptualizing the existence of such an old ruin uh, and how, to what extent how it could be maintained and how it could be shared in the most uh, constructive way. This was, of course, in collaboration also with UNESCO. So here you see Palmyra from the air, superb. We had the conversations with the main archaeologist who was later killed by ISIS. We visited the theater, uh, and here you see the theater kind of a year later uh, as the capital of ISIS. And now we see this kind of situation, Syria war drags on, but Assad's future looks severe, secure as ever. And I think that here again, and some diplomats uh, agree with me, the moralism uh, of the West, the, the support supposedly of the kind of rebels, but without uh, a real investment uh, and therefore kind of just words and not deeds, uh, created a, a really disaster where kind of 400,000 uh, people died. Syria is a bloodbath. Uh, our ethical politics has, in short, proved itself rather unethical. This was the Dutch ambassador who kind of worked there. And I would say again that kind of our moralism uh, and morality in many cases has a completely counterproductive effect and uh, is, uh, would, and, and, and I think it is kind of really time that we think about it because in the end, it was just words and the situation is largely unchanged. I want to end with a kind of perhaps better story uh, in the Arab world, in Doha. And I want to end here with kind of simply showing that by working in these uh, nations, you also learn and your architecture or your own assumptions uh, change. 
Uh, Doha is a country uh, like many Middle Eastern countries with an amazing capacity where for 300,000 local people to inhabit a city of 1 million eight, i.e. almost 80% immigrants, uh, uh, and, and that is a kind of form of uh, coexistence uh, and partly tolerance, which I think is very crucial to, to look, uh, to take seriously. It's a country, uh, a very modern country, where the royal family is involved in changing uh, the culture and where I think something really interesting is happening where all the categories that we keep separate are blurred and, and considered as a single emancipating cloud for not so much uh, entertainment, but for the cultivation and uh, the emancipation of the population. And there are everywhere uh, billboards uh, kind of thing in all languages, so not only kind of in English. And actually, uh, I have to say that really made me kind of think and made me very grateful when I was able to do a project which is, uh, ultimately became the National Library. It was said that Qataris are not great readers, so that the National Library needs to be an, an, an invitation to read and uh, provocation to read. So what I did, I took a kind of square floor plate and kind of folded three sides so that uh, I create a kind of amphitheatrical uh, situation, an amphitheater for books. Then I took the same shape and kind of put it and used it as a roof. And because I um, folded the kind of sides, it was a building where if you enter, you enter in the middle, kind of rather than on the perimeter. So if you enter, you in one glance kind of see every book and every part of the content. Um, one thing I learned in uh, Qatar is the uh, amount of private space that people need and with which they feel uh, comfortable. In other words, uh, they, there is no sense of intimacy or closeness is differently defined and that in itself creates a kind of real sense of serenity and so therefore I want to end the kind of presentation with a number of images of that kind of serenity in uh, the real space. The, it's a vast uh, large building which is completely transparent and so therefore at any one point you see people in the foreground but also in the background, you're always surrounded by books. And therefore, uh, it, there is a kind of sense uh, to this building which uh, I've never uh, kind of approached uh, uh, before. Before, you know, everything was much more kind of compact and uh, compressed. And here, uh, I, I learned kind of through this engagement uh, with a different culture to uh, think uh, architecture in a kind of different way. Uh, and so uh, I want to end, I have only 45 minutes uh, left, uh, to simply say that uh, political motivation uh, has been uh, uh, a crucial part of our architectural choices uh, and that we deliberately kind of chose not to kind of support uh, moralism or not to adopt a position of moralism because we think that moralism, uh, Western style, is discredited for all kinds of reasons that I indicated and that we are more in interested in engaging different uh, kind of worlds and seeing how uh, positive uh, collaborations uh, can also have positive effects. Thank you.